Good evening all. We hope you are well and are keeping safe in the current climate. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Pat Lowton. I am the Knowledge Exchange Manager for the South Region in the AHDB Pork Team. I will be facilitating this evening's meeting. Tonight we're going to be looking into breeding herd management with Adrian Cox. Just a couple of housekeeping points before we start. All participants are on mute and are unable to communicate verbally through onto this webinar. Today's session is running for an hour and a half, starting at seven and ending at the latest of 8.30. The webinar session is being recorded and all those who have registered will receive a link in a follow-up email 24 to 48 hours after we finished. It will also be available on various online platforms, such as our website, our YouTube channel and the BPA website. So please don't worry about taking too many notes. For those of you who are signed up with our online training record, PigPro, you're able to log your attendance on there. We'll be taking questions throughout. There's an allocated 10 minute Q&A slot at the end of the session for me to put any questions that have not been answered and to give you time to, to, to ask anything else. any problems with audio or visual then flag to us through the question box slide the slide shows how to ask a question on a laptop on a phone it's a question mark button other attendees will not be able to see your questions i will ask any questions as i receive them and any we don't get to or that come in afterwards i will ask in the q a session at the end if you have any questions after the event, then we will go over how to send these at the end. Tonight's team. So introducing Adrian Cox. I'm in the middle and Tina is in the background helping to run the show. Over to you, Adrian. Thank you very much, Pat. And thank you everybody for logging in this evening. Um, first error, I don't seem to have control of the slides. Tina, can you get me, a, give me up the next slide, please? Anyway, excellent, thank you. So the purpose of this evening's uh, webinar is to discuss breeding herd management, breeding herd operations. And as you can see from this opening slide, we would say that the aim of a good breeding herd performance is to achieve a good number of piglets being born um, to sows, which can then rear them through the farrowing department to get good weaners for performing well post weaning. So breeding herd comprises the whole of service, dry sow management and farrowing. But for the purposes of this evening's talk, we're just going to be concentrating on service and dry sow. Obviously, it's impossible in the time constraints we've got this evening to have a completely full explanation of all areas of sow management, but hopefully anything that doesn't get covered, you'll be able to ask through questions, or if not this evening, later on through the AHDB website. And if for any reason we can't answer, I'm sure, uh, your own veterinary surgeon will be able to help you later on. I have the next slide, please, Tina. So how do we assess breeding herd performance? 
A um, number of different potential parameters, um, number of piglets born alive in a litter, number of piglets weaned, how many litters a sow has in any given year, or number of pigs weaned per sow per year is a figure that the industry would utilise a lot. But if we're looking to encompass the whole breeding herd and have the whole team involved, then arguably a better figure would be the total litter weight that is um, being weaned in any one year. Slide, please. So as you'll be aware, probably 40% plus of our industry is outdoors. And not surprisingly, there is a difference in apparent performance between indoor and outdoor units with probably according to this data from Agrisoft, which is as up to date as we can get, a difference of three and a half piglets weaned between an indoor unit and an outdoor unit. Now, obviously, this doesn't encompass every single herd within the country, and the, the differences between those may differ between individual units, but as a generality, that trend would be correct. So, it, performance, as you can see, is improving year on year with the little commas marks next to the figures indicating improvements in numbers weaned, number of litters per sow per year, year on year. So the key point is to understand how your unit is performing and what areas there are that you can make improvements on so as to improve overall herd productivity. Next slide please. So what is it that differentiates a better performing unit from one that perhaps is performing less well? Is it the fact that uh, better performing herds have more modern buildings? They perhaps have better genetics on the unit, which are able to have better litter sizes and cope with the rigors of weaning those piglets better? Or is it that to be a very good performing unit, you need to have a very high health status? There's no doubt that all of the above is very useful, but to my mind, the most important aspect to differentiate a good performing unit from a poorer performing herd is the quality of the staff that are working on that unit. Their level of enthusiasm, their level of training, and importantly, attention to detail. So without a shadow of a doubt, in my mind, it's staff that make the difference between a good and bad herd. And the more that staff can be encouraged to be motivated, I'm sure the more rewards that has in terms of output. Next slide, please. So there are many factors that will dictate breeding herd performance. Um, several of them are listed on this particular slide. So arguably performance starts by preparing the sow for, for the coming up performance with her previous stay in the farrowing department so that she's prepared for her next service and progression through gestation. Similarly, introduction of guilt, it's vital that they are introduced correctly so that they are ready to be managed correctly and served well. Service management, good environment, correct feeding, all of these things are vital. And again, although it's last on this particular list, by no means least, staff quality. Next slide, please. So you'll often hear people talking about firing rate and how important it is. So in essence, firing rate is just the percentage of sows or gilts from a given service group that farrow down. Slide please. The point, the reason that it's important is that it allows you to understand how many sows need to be served in any given week or batch in order to keep the farrowing department full. So if we're looking to farrow approximately 20 sows per week, if we had perfect performance with no sows misbehaving and everything firing down that was served, we would only need to serve 20 animals per week. Obviously, this is slightly unrealistic. Well, it is certainly for any length of time. So knowing your firing rate enables you to determine how many sows need serving. 
So I would normally work on an average firing rate of approximately 85% for clients. And if we're doing better than that, we can scale back on services. And importantly, if we're not achieving the correct number of firings in a week, it focuses our attention on trying to understand why. Slide, please. As mentioned slightly earlier, seasonality can have some impact upon breeding herd performance. And although this slide is slightly aged, the concept that it shows nonetheless is important. You can see this is the same unit that was tracked over several consecutive years. And as you can see from it, although the absolute figures may be changed year on year, the trend overall is exactly the same. With good performance at the start, the end of the season, and a dip in the middle. Slide please. So if we know where we get a dip in firing rate, it enables us to perhaps target more successfully guilt into the unit to services at any critical period. And that hopefully avoids any gap in the firing department since empty firing space is obviously so very costly. Slide, please. So how many litters is it possible for a sow to have in a given year? So if we work on the basis of a sow cycle being approximately 150 days, that allows for the period from when she's weaned through to being served, gestation period, and then a four week lactation, the entire sow cycle is approximately 150 days. So that equates in a given year of 365 days to an optimal level of performance of 2.43 litres per sow. As we saw from a previous slide, the UK average for indoor herd and indeed outdoor is approximately 2.3 litres per sow per year. So somewhere in the system, we're losing 0.13 litres. And with a bit of maths, we can work out that that equates to approximately 21 days per sow per year where the sow is not working. Slide please. So what does that mean in terms of financial costing to the unit? So if we, this data on here is slightly aged when we were looking at um, litters weaned or piglets weaned per litter at 11.9. Again, the table earlier shows that performance is lifted from here. But if we use this set of data, it shows that there's a difference potentially between perfect performance and average performance on an indoor unit of one and a half pigs per sow per year. Now, these extra pigs are gained without any real extra costs in terms of labor, semen costs, feed to the sow. And as such, they're called marginal pigs, and industry would estimate these to be worth approximately £50 each. So those one and a half pigs are worth something in the order of £80 of extra profit per sow per year, or in this instance, potentially lost profit. And again, if we divide that by the 21 non-productive days that the sow is having, this costs us approximately 380 per day that a sow is not working, as in she's not getting prepared for her pregnancy, isn't pregnant, or isn't suckling a litter. Slide, please. So there are several reasons why sows or indeed gilts don't uh, work for us. Um, perhaps they've returned to heat following a normal service, or maybe unfortunately the litter has been aborted from a sow that was pregnant, or arguably worst case scenario, the sow dies whilst she's uh, pregnant. And particularly with outdoor herds in very hot summer months, it's unfortunately not uncommon for odd sows to die from heat stress in late, in late gestation. And that certainly is financially devastating to the unit. Slide please. So this slide is my favorite of the evening and just looks like a standard table. 
but what happened with this slide is that um, staff on a farm were asked to serve over the period of a year 256 sows each. Now the sows were sorted on a weekly basis such that there was no preference given to any particular person with respect to more fertile animals, animals which come on to heat more readily, anything like that. So it's purely randomized standard trial. As can be seen, the difference in performance here between number one and number six equate, or number two and number six equates to over a thousand piglets born from 256 sows served. So an absolutely staggering difference and that was all down to staff impact. And that shows the importance that you as staff have on dictating unit performance and why I'm so keen on ensuring that staff are well trained and motivated. Another um, trial, which unfortunately isn't shown on, on this slide, was where the same staff were followed throughout the course of the year and their firing rate or conception rates to the sales they served on a weekly basis were tracked. And what that transpired to show was that during the um, weeks that they were in a good mood when it came to serving sows, the, um, the performance was much better than in those weeks when they were perhaps going to work in a bad mood, were serving sows in more of a rush and had less empathy with the sows that they were serving. So again, attitude of the staff at the timing of service is important as it shows in the output of the breeding herd performance. A slide please, Tina. So good, good breeding herd performance is uh, dictated, as we said before, right from the word go with establishing the sow ready to serve by managing her correctly during the firing department. And this slide just shows how the effect of sows coming out to the firing department, coming on to heat promptly, the impact that has on conception rate and litter size. And essentially, the more promptly sows come on to heat, the better performance tends to be. Slide. So one of the key points about firing performance is to ensure that sows do not drop too much condition during their lactation, otherwise performance suffers. And whilst the absolute figures on this slide are of uh, little importance, the key point to note is that the fitter the sow exits firing, generally the better their performance is going to be. They turn up back to heat more promptly and they have better litter size. That the um, adjunct to that, however, is that it is all um, comparative. So a sow coming out in good condition that went in excessively overfit is has still lost an awful lot of condition and is likely to perform less well than a sow that has had standard uh, condition at entry and exit and hasn't lost too much. Slide please. So what happens when piglets are weaned and uh, what's happening to the sow? Obviously the process of weaning is simply the removal of piglets and this triggers a, um, a hormonal change in the sow such that the level of prolactin, which is the hormone responsible for milk production, drops. And this allows for the increase in uh, hormones to develop the eggs in the uter in the ovaries and for ovulation to occur and for oestrogen to come to the fore such that the sow shows signs of oestrus. Slide please. So we've weaned the sow, but we want to make sure that she is in the best possible attitude for serving several days later. So how do we manage her between weaning and service to get her in the best possible state for a good successful 
service and pregnancy with a good number of litters, uh, piglets, sorry. So one of the points to consider is something called the seven S's, whereby we give the sows plenty of space, they are well fed, they're given good levels of light, that they kept at a sensible temperature, they're given good bore contact, they're sized into their groups, and they are as little stressed as is possible. Slide, please. So how do we determine the best time to serve a sow? It's fine to say we need we can serve her, but to get a good service, we need to identify the optimum time. The best effect is to take the sow to the bore pen such that they, they show a good standing response to heat. Obviously, sows and boars in the same pen, that should be pretty good for um, heat detection since the boar should be jumping around on the sow and it should, should be very clear. But overall, a sow, a boar should be much better at identifying sows on heat than stock people. But generally, the best combination is to have a boar and a stock person walking through the group similarly, trying to identify animals. Slide, please. So if we were to leave uh, sow and boar just to get on with it, they tend to follow a logical sequence which I'm sure the vast majority of you will have seen on your units, allowing natural mating to occur. So the first process is where the boar is trying to determine whether the sow is actually going to be receptive to him serving her. He does everything he can to stimulate her by nudging her along her flanks, sniffing her to try and check receptiveness. Then he'll try a mounter, placing his chin on the back of her to try and initiate some standing heat through his weight. And all being well, he'll then be able to stand and serve her successfully. So with a very mature boar and a sow that's been served several times, this is a process that can occur fairly swiftly. Put a boar into a pen, fairly quickly leaps on the sow, job done. However, if you've got a less experienced boar, in particular if you've got gilts that are coming on to heat for the first time, this sequence can actually take substantially longer than you might believe. And as a consequence, the key point from that is to ensure that you give your sows plenty of time to show that they're properly on heat when you're trying to detect heat from them and determine when to serve. Slide, please. So in an ideal world, we'd heat detect sows twice daily. And as we've said, we take sows to the bore pen rather than the other way around. The use of mature chatting bores is preferable to a younger boar because the pheromones coming through in the boar's saliva is helpful in eliciting standing response to her. And that's why nose to nose contact and good visualization and access to one another is so important. It's useful to take sounds or, or present sounds to the boar in small groups such that they all have a chance to show a standing reflex. There's no point trying to put 20 sows in front of a boar and saying that the back ones aren't on heat because they're just not getting the same level of stimulation. And in a situation where we're wanting to encourage sows promptly onto heat, often leaving a boar with very good contact to the weaned sow group for three days, four days post weaning, and then removing him from access to the sows such that they can then be represented to the boar on service day, anticipated service day, will elicit a very good standing response. And on those units that I visit where perhaps sows are reported to not be coming into heat as strongly as expected post-service, sorry, post-weaning, good boar access and stimulation and management in that critical period between 
weaning and service period is something that we would definitely focus upon. Slide please. So some people get slightly confused between the different terms of oestrus and ovulation. And essentially, oestrus is just the period of standing heat when the female will stand for the bore or be able to be inseminated, whilst ovulation is the process by which eggs are released from the ovary. And in sows, we know that this occurs approximately two thirds of the way through the standing heat. Slide, please. So that's fine to know in theory, but what we need to know is what are the signs of oestrus in a cell so that we can identify them and then initiate service at the correct time. Generally, cells are gonna show a swelling and reddening of the vulva. That's probably in fact more obvious in young gilts compared to an older sow, but you might notice some clear discharge from the vulva. Sows will often be more restless, they'll come to the front of the pen as you walk by, sort of seeking out a bore. They'll often have their ears rather more pricked than normal, and there's often a lot of activity within the pen with sows on heat riding one another and that often elicits marks on the shoulders or on the back as shown in the bottom right hand photograph. Slide please. So as we've just said, sows tend to ovulate approximately two thirds of the way through their standing oestrus. We also know that sows that come on to heat more promptly after weaning tend to stand for a longer period. And so it means that we need to know when sows come on to heat in order to identify the best timing for service. In an ideal world, we'd be looking to serve sows twice, sort of 18 to 24 hours apart. And I would always recommend that sows are checked for a third time to see if they'll stand the following day. Reason for this is that if we get a good percentage of sows that are on heat on day three and are served, tends to suggest that we've been a little bit too early with our initial service on day one. We might need to rejig the timing. Slide please. So why does it matter if we're slightly out of kilter with the timing of service? After all, we're gonna get the sow hopefully in pig anyway. The reason that timing a service is so critical is that it has an impact upon litter size. So going back to this somewhat nearer the start of the talk, the six people who were serving the 256 sounds, one of those members of staff had a very good um, firing rate, but their litter size was poorer than a number of their teammates. And that would suggest that perhaps their timing of service was less good than their other colleagues. So the key point with this slide is that we want to get as many of the eggs fertilized as possible. So we want as much blue in the slide as possible because that's the 100% level of fertilization. And as we can see, that tends to occur within the eight hours prior to service. And it's not much deviation either side of service before we start to get significantly lower levels of eggs fertilized. So we really need to promptly identify when cells are coming on such that we can get and when they are best served such that we can get an understanding of best timing of, of, of service to maximize eggs fertilized. One of the things that we'd often do is something called oestrus mapping, where we'd look for when sows came on to heat, when sows went off heat, and from that try and determine the best time that mating should have occurred and see how close to that criteria service was actually undertaken. And if there are issues with variable or poor litter size, that can be a very useful tool at helping to tighten up the timing of service and maximizing productivity. Okay, slide please. 
So in an ideal world, we'd be able to uh, develop our service areas from a blueprint and have a perfect scenario. This picture just shows a standard indoor service area and has some very good points associated with it. And I'd urge you to have a look at it later on when you've got a few minutes to reassess the layout of this site and decide on the good and bad points as you see them. From my point of view, however, key points of note are it's very hygienic, the floor is dry and non-slippery, it's very well lit, so light is increased further by the walls being whitewashed and the roof also being white. Anything that's required is close to hand, so we've got catheters readily available, we've got the plastic horseshoe aids readily available, um, aerosol cans to mark cells, and importantly, there's a semen temperature storage box there, and that enables semen to be stored at the correct temperature during the service morning or afternoon. One of my clients I was chatting to last week, in fact, mentioned that since they'd started to use one of these at the period of serving, they'd noticed that their firing rate had increased by a percentage and that litter size had also improved. So even relatively small changes and tweaks to current service management can have a significant impact on herd productivity. And particularly in the winter for outdoor herds, I think it's very useful to check that semen storage prior to insemination is correct because any significant chilling on that semen and performance will be down. Slide please. So obviously we now need to serve the sow. We've identified that she's uh, ready to be served. So how are we going to uh, have good practice for inseminating her? As we've just mentioned, semen needs to be correctly stored at 17 degrees, it needs to be taken to the service area in an insulated box. And then ideally, as noted on that previous slide, put into a temperature storage box rather than just left in the poly box. Facilities should be well lit. Flooring should be uh, non-slippery, such that the sow's comfortable and relaxed to stand easily. And that helps to identify them on heat more easily. And that we've got good nose-to-nose -nose contact during the process of insemination having had a period of time when the sow's been away to, from the boar. We only try and serve a small number of sows at a time. The area is hygienic and as we've mentioned earlier, absolutely critically, the process is undertaken in a calm, quiet and chilled manner so as to maximise performance. Anything that increases the adrenaline level in those sounds, they're pushed through quickly, they're shouted at, that's all going to result in deteriorating performance. So a calm, quiet approach is absolutely key. Slide, please. So the actual process of inseminating sounds is obviously far better learnt through actually undertaking the process than it's going to be through any sort of online webinar session. But general principle is to be hygienic. So ensure the vulva is clean, part the vulva lips and insert the catheter inwards and slightly upwards. Progress the catheter until the ridges of the cervix are felt and the catheter locks in position. Attach the seam and flat pack to the catheter continuing to stimulate the sounds such that they draw semen in and that, that stimulation is absolutely key. So sit on the back of the sows, rub the flanks of the sows, use artificial aids to encourage them to stand and draw semen in. And absolutely key from that slide in front of us, do not rush insemination process. There's no point rushing the process to get through the number of cells and be ha happy that the job's been finished if you haven't got any cells firing down in four months time. 
and then importantly give the sow an opportunity to rest after service in front of a boar so that she continues to suck that semen into the um, into her such that uh, it aids transport to the site of fertilization and then after a rest period in front of boars quietly move them back to the pens that they've come from. So as you can see from this photo sows are absolutely rock on heat only three to the boar so they've small groups again they're prick-eared, standing absolutely rigid, and they've got extra stimulation there in the form of these plastic hoops to encourage them to stand. And you can see from the flat pack in the middle that semen's being sucked in easily without anybody stood there squeezing it from the, from the fact that there's very little semen left at the bottom of that flat pack. Slide, please. So there's now a short video of somebody uh, AIing a sound. If you can just uh, click that to start, please. So some good points about this. You can see that that sow has got good bore contact in front of her, that she's absolutely rock solid. Semen catheter is within a plastic outer such that there was no handling of the catheter by the person undertaking the, serving, the serving, and that then the catheter was released uh, at the end after it was locked in position to enable insemination to occur by the insertion of the flat pack. So that's generally good uh, protocol. See how clean the area is, and you can see how clean the sow is. Arguably, be even better if the vulva of the sow had been wiped, and maybe one could argue if the operator was wearing gloves to reduce any risk of uh, infection or lowering the risk of infection. Slide, please. So, to reiterate the AI protocol, want to ensure that the sow is properly on heat. So good heat detection. Ideally, wipe the vulva clean with a piece of blue paper toweling. Consider wearing gloves. If necessary, apply some lubricant to the catheter to ensure that it's inserted more easily. Some clients would utilize pre-lubricated catheters. The important thing with lubricant is to ensure that it is suitable for use with AI and also that the container you're uh, pouring the lubricant from is clean and hygienic so we're not inadvertently putting a load of bacteria and grot on the end of the catheter tip which might trigger infection later. Carefully part the vulval lips so that we're reducing the likelihood of taking any dirt from the outside inside with the catheter and gently insert the catheter upwards and inwards. Wait till the cervix is felt and the catheter is locked in position. Attach the semen and continue to stimulate the sow whilst she draws in the semen. Once service has been completely finished and she's resting, then the catheter can be slowly withdrawn. And I prefer that uh, stockmen remove the catheters after service rather than having sows walking around with catheters still in, which other sows start chewing on and pulling out. Because there is a risk that catheters can act as a bit of a wick and grot can go up the catheter and risk an infection. Slide, please. So again, just a few pictorial pictures to show the serving protocol. So small number of sows in front of boars, wiping the vulva, catheter insertion by having parted the vulval lips and carefully attaching the semen bottle. There's obviously a little bit of continuity error here because uh, nobody's going to take their gloves off during the process of serving. So apologies for that. The protocol is sound as demonstrated there. Slide, please. And again, following the introduction of catheter, continue to stimulate that sow by maintaining good bore contact and rubbing the flank and other line of the sow so as to encourage her to draw that semen in. Slide, please. 
So once she's been served, allow the cell uh, rest period um, in a stable group near to the bore such that she can carry on resting and allowing that semen to be transported to the site of fertilization. Ideally, the bull would probably show a little bit more interest than is apparent from this particular slide, but she still has the stimulation provided by those horseshoe plastic aids. Slide, please. So having served her, what do we now need to consider to maximize performance? Obviously, we need to ensure that we've got decent dry sow accommodation, sows are well fed, that there's no inopportune mixing, and we want to confirm that pregnancy, ideally through PDing, otherwise checking for returns, slide please. So what makes good dry sow accommodation? Obviously, anything that minimizes stress has got to be something to consider but plenty of space, good temperature for the sow, so somewhere in the region of 18 to 20 degrees. Obviously that's unable to be achieved with outdoor sows currently, but ensuring they've got a good warm, dry lying area to go back into will help to maintain performance. Good lighting levels, again, easier on indoor units than outdoor units, and it's particularly important at this time of year when we've had and got rapidly shortening daylight length that we provide adequate light levels. So I'd be looking for 16 hours per day in dry sow accommodation. And that would be achieved by having lights on timers, and if needs be a sensor in the sow shed so that if it gets dark during the day, lights can be turned on automatically rather than relying on stockmen to turn them on and off during the day as necessary. And importantly, no bullying of the sow by trying to avoid mixing wherever possible. Slide, please. So this just uh, quickly illustrates the impact that mixing of sows at inopportune moments can have. So sows deliberately mixed after they've been served. And in essence, what it's trying to show is that if we're going to mix and move sows, it's far better undertaken promptly after service than during the sort of two week stage or delaying movement until four weeks plus. Interestingly, in this instance, the stable group sows pit have slightly poorer performance than those animals that have been mixed. But I would suggest to clients that if we're looking to uh, achieve maximum performance, we either keep sows in stable groups or if we need to move and mix sales, it's either done immediately post service or preferably wait until they're at least five weeks in pig such that the pregnancy is properly established. Slide, please. So, as you know, sales come back onto heat every 21 days, give or take. Although this does fluctuate, uh, and a standard regular return will be 18 to 24 days after mating. So, as we said earlier in the talk, it's important to identify sows that aren't earning their keep, so we don't want to accrue too many non productive days on the unit. So, we're looking to identify returns as rapidly as possible. So, ideally, ensure that. The sows have got boars walking through them to look for returns 18 to 24 days after they've been served. And particularly with gilts, I'd actually try and keep the boar present for the first month or so after service, as this seems to help encourage better uh, pregnancy rates in these younger animals. Look, for all, look at all the animals in the pen, observing for riding marks. And the reason it's important to look for returns is that it helps give us as vets a clue as to where problems may be occurring on the unit. So if we have returns occurring primarily at 18 to 24 days, so what we would call regular returns, these tend to indicate a failure of fertilization, which would trigger us to perhaps look at pre-service and service management. Whilst returns occurring slightly later, at maybe 28, 30, 32 days, would tend to indicate 
uh, loss of an early pregnancy, focusing our direction in other avenues. Slide, please. So as we said, ideally we'd confirm pregnancy in the cells. Not all clients do, they rely on very good observation for returns. But assessing pregnancy just gives us more comfort and confidence that we can predict the number of animals coming forward to farrow and also enables us at a very early stage to consider how many gilts we might need to introduce to the unit in preparation for making the service target when the current PD batch of cells have farrowed down. So PDing is probably easiest undertaken at four, three, four, five weeks of gestation when you see lots of little black circles with white dots in the middle, which are the developing embryo. As the embryo grows, less, less fluid is present and it makes it slightly harder to PD the animal if you're not experienced. But again, as they age, you start to see the bone developing in the piglets and that starts to be a very easy means of identifying uh, piglets and hence pregnancy. In an ideal world, we scan cells at maybe four and five weeks gestation then again at seven and eight weeks gestation and then ideally do a visual inspection at 10 11 weeks of gestation to confirm that there haven't been any dropouts and to ensure that things such as vaccination protocols are occurring at the correct stage slide please Slide, please. So, sow feeding is absolutely critical for um, good performance or rather correct sow feeding. Um, any sow or gilt which tends to be too thin or too fit generally have shorter productive lives on units and tend not to survive so long in the herd with poorer fertility. So correct feeding is paramount to maintaining good performance. Slide please. Slide please. Sorry there must be a quite a delay. I'm sure you probably all you. I'm sure you've probably all seen uh, pictures of the sound condition scoring charts before, where sounds are scored between one and five, uh, with one indicating a very thin, uh, verging on emaciated sow, whilst a uh, score of five is more akin to a hippopotamus than to a breeding sow. As generality, I would be looking to try and ensure that sows are kept in condition score three, plus or minus uh, maybe half a condition score during the entire period of her cycle for 12 months of the year ideally. Slide please. Slide please. So how do we achieve good condition to the cells? So again the absolute figures on this chart aren't relevant to you. There's no reason to uh, make note of these particularly. The feed levels are going to alter depending on whether it's an indoor unit, an outdoor unit, the density of the rations, maybe the condition of the sows being fed. But the overall curve would be something akin on all farms. It doesn't really matter whether you're uh, farming a thousand sows, 10,000 sows, or whether you've got a couple of sows in the backyard, the principles would be the same. So between weaning and service, we try and offer a very high energy dense feed at as maximum a level as the sows will take, so as to encourage good levels of ovulation and good quality eggs. And then I'd often feed, uh, the feed would then be dropped down, but kept slightly higher than the rest of gestation for the first month, so as to allow for good development of placenta 
And whilst there's an argument that feed levels should be dropped immediately after service because it's felt high feed levels can impact on litter size in a negative way, in all honesty, I've never found this to be the case. So I tend not to worry about that. Or if the client's very concerned, perhaps I'd alter it for the first 48 hours. After the first month, feed levels are dropped so as to avoid sounds becoming too fit and also to uh, avoid excessive costs and then lifting feed again in the last uh, three weeks prior to farrowing in order to try and maximize birth weight to the piglets uh, again reducing feed levels immediately prior to farrowing in order to avoid any risks of farrowing fever uh, constipation, risks of stillbirths in, in farrowing, and then obviously step up to appetite as soon as possible after farrowing. Slide please. So we can't really have a talk on sow performance from a vet and not at least touch on some of the diseases that can have a significant impact upon breeding her performance. In all honesty, there's not enough time to do any in-depth talking on all of those subjects, but I hasten to say there are a lot of diseases that can negatively impact upon breeding her performance. You'll note at the bottom of the slide, I've put stockmanship. Now granted, that's not a disease process per se, but as ably demonstrated by some of the slides earlier on in this talk, it's very obvious that stockmanship can have a significant impact on breeding her performance. And that's always going to be a focus of attention on visits to make sure that stockmanship is absolutely at the best it can be, because even in a disease process, good stockmanship will often help to mitigate some of the impacts of the diseases mentioned here. Slide please. Slide please. So each unit will have its own unique health concerns and those are obviously best discussed with your own uh, private veterinary surgeon rather than uh, maybe covered in detail in a webinar such as this but the key points would be if you haven't got a disease problem uh, with say PERS try your level best to avoid getting PERS into the unit if you do have a disease problem then try your level best to control it and that would be normally through a combination of good management protocols and often vaccination programs as well as drawn up and devised by a veterinary surgeon and probably part of your veterinary health plan. Slide please. So one of the key points with vaccination is to ensure that it's managed correctly, that it's given at the right time as advised by a veterinary surgeon, that it's administered in the correct route. So if it's an intramuscular injection, it wants to be given intramuscularly, ensuring that needle length is correct. And importantly, it's vital that bottles are used up correctly. All of these uh, vaccine bottles have a warning on them that once opened, they should be used within so many hours. And certainly vaccines shouldn't be rolled week to week or batch to batch as there's a risk that their efficacy will be reduced, protection you're expecting from them diminished and problems ensuing as a consequence. Slide please. So Despite your best efforts in managing uh, your sow herd, some animals will need to be culled from the unit. The key point is to try and drive the culling yourself rather than have the culling policy dictated on you by underperforming females. And those units that are performing best tend to be in charge of their own culling 
protocols. So ideally, you'd be looking to remove cells from the unit based on their age and their performance. Sometimes there'd be issues associated with lameness to necessitate their culling or mastitis coming out of farrowing. Odd cells are a little bit more awkward. Maybe their temperament isn't suitable to the unit. And cells which often go hand in hand with their age get too big that can have more problems in farrowing. So that would be another good reason for culling. Infertility, particularly if it's ongoing and if it's unable to be understood as to why cells are not breeding properly, obviously is driving the culling program rather than you being in charge. And that warrants investigation by your veterinary surgeon. Slide, please. So if we're going to cull cells from the unit, we obviously need to replace them. And that's where replacement gilts come in. And they can either be purchased or home bred from a breeding company or for a smaller operator, maybe from another breeder. It's vital that they are integrated into the herd carefully and in order and they go through a comprehensive program of vaccination and maybe bugging up protocols acclimatization to your unit such that they are exposed and hopefully immune to any disease challenges on the unit and that they are correctly fed and managed such they are prepared for service a lot of units now would synchronize gilts to slot them in for uh, service periods that suit, particularly important obviously in a batch system. But if you recall back to the slide we showed earlier of a unit where over a five year period performance was following a distinct trend, we know that on that herd, if we could slide extra gilts in to offset that lower period of fertility, that we would help to offset costly issue of gap in farrowings three months later. So good management of the gilt pool is vital for uh, breeding herd success and is an area probably that requires a whole talk on its own rather than trying to be shoehorned in this evening. Slide please. So slightly odd looking slide here, uh, steam train and some carriages. So one of my previous bosses, a very well uh, revered pig vet in his time, he used to equate the gilt pool on a unit as the engine that was the driver of the, of the train. And each carriage represented a parity of sows. So if he had a a large engine there at the front and a relatively low number of carriages that train and hence the unit would perform very well and tick along at a good pace whereas if the engine was rather small and underpowered and there were a large number of carriages being pulled then the uh, train would struggle speed would be down and uh, the, as a consequence in the analogy, the unit would be performing less well. So a slightly odd analogy, but think of the guilt pool as the driver for the unit. And a good strong guilt pool is absolutely key to excellent productivity from the cell herd. Slide, please. So Good gilt intake enables us to have a preponderance, hopefully, of younger females within the unit, which are performing well. We know that on the majority of units, cell performance slides off as they age, and particularly often beyond parity six, but on an ever-increasing number of units now, maybe even parity five, performance drops substantially with uh, less numbers of piglets weaned per cell from the farrowing department and often lower farrowing rates as well to those animals. So a good strong gilt pool enables us to maintain good
the correct parity profile of the herd so as to maximize performance from the unit. Slide please. So you'll no doubt be pleased to hear that this is my final slide of the talk and just summarizes the things that I feel are absolutely key on a unit for excellent performance. So we've got the introduction of guilt to enable the culling out of less productive cells. And obviously those guilts need to be managed correctly in order for them to themselves achieve good performance. Mismanagement of guilts and the uh, time up to their first service often not only reduces guilt performance, but it often seems to reduce the performance of the animal for its entire productive life. So that's an area that perhaps is better focused on in another uh, discussion or if HDB don't run one, discuss the importance with your own veterinary surgeon. Obviously, we need to control any health challenges on the unit. So combination of management, vaccination protocols. As we've said, we want to ensure that the environment is always correct for the animals, such that they are kept at the correct temperature, they've got enough space, there's no bullying no drafts, minimize any stress on the cells at all, so avoid moving and mixing at inopportune moments particularly. Ensure that the cells are correctly fed and obviously access to water. But I make no apologies for, at the top of this slide, having stockmanship as my number one criteria. It's my genuine belief that good stockmanship is the absolute key for good performance of the sow herd. And time spent investing in training of stockmen and ensuring that uh, they're motivated and well-skilled, hopefully has benefits in overall unit performance. So that's the end of this, this evening's talk. Um, just come in on time. And if there are any questions that have been fed through, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Back to you, Pat. So sorry for the slight delay that seems to be occurring, but any questions that have been filled through, I'll be happy to answer. Or as we said at the start, there's going to be a option to send um, questions through later onto the website, which we'll try and answer at a later date when they've been collated. I have got some questions that have come through, Adrian. Uh, first going to be questions. Yeah, I'm sorry for it. I'll try and, I'll Go try and answer them. Yeah, they're all they're answerable. What <laughs> is the best age to breed from a gilt and similarly a boar? And that's for a uh, Oxford and Sandy Black, which probably right. is going to be a slightly different answer to a normal. So, um, for uh, commercial pig pig units. Um, Breeding companies would tend to suggest uh, ages at which sows or oh, sorry gilts are best bred, and for a commercial animal that would tend to be somewhere from seven to eight months of age. For rarer breed animals like an Oxford Sandy and Black, I would tend to say that I'd be looking at something like an eight-month-old gilt, so something in the order of. Um, 240 days of age and for a boar I wouldn't really want a boar to be doing any level of significant work before they're 10 months to a year of age in an ideal world. The next question is if a gilt goes to the boar to be served is traveling a few hours in a trailer is it dangerous 
at any period in particular in pregnancy? We wouldn't want to transport um, animals, particularly late in pregnancy. The legal time frames on transport of animals in late pregnancy. So I would try and avoid transport of sows um, in late in late pregnancy for a very late pregnancy for that reason. In early pregnancy, loading and moving animals is quite stressful. So again, if it was possible, I would try and avoid moving them probably until they are confirmed in pig and uh, probably five weeks plus in pig, like I said earlier. But if it's literally a single animal that's going to go into um, a trailer on her own with a deep straw bread bed, loads very easily and is easily um, managed when she gets back home. The risk's probably not great, but I'd try and avoid doing it around that 10 days to three week period. So either early after service or like I said earlier, beyond four or five weeks gestation. The next one, how do, peop how do stock people affect farrowing rates so much? Is it only attitude? Uh, no, um, good good stockmen that are well trained. Um, obviously, if they if they are serving with the right attitude, sales definitely pick up and respond as do all as do all um, uh, species of animal. Just prior to this evening's talk, I was trying to uh, move some cattle down the road and into a shed and um, knew I was tight for time, trying to do it as I would tell people to do it, being nice and quiet, and I'm pleased to say I managed it. And they moved very easily. If I'd been shouting and screaming and hollering at them at the top of my voice, I know that they'd have been scattering around the field in all directions and I wouldn't have been able to move them. The same is exactly the case with sows. If you're quiet and relaxed with how you approach and manage them around the service period, definitely seem to get improved performance. But as that slide demonstrated for the six staff members that serve the 256 sows over the course of the year, good training, good knowledge, observation, and skill set of when to serve a sow and how to serve a sow was absolutely paramount, paramount there as demonstrated by a difference of a thousand piglets over 256 sows served. So really it's attitude and skill. Uh, right, there's a few more coming in now. Um, how do you measure back fat? Um, you can get um, uh, ultrasound measurement devices that will sit on the back of the sow um, and you can uh, measure in the same way that uh, carcasses are measured perhaps or similar in a way that carcasses are measured at the slaughterhouse, same sort of position. But the other trick would be to either weigh the sow using uh, obviously a set of scales or to consider using a weigh tape such that uh, when she's farrowed down you can use a weigh tape to get an estimate of her weight do the same again at weaning and the theory is for every um, 10 or 20 kilos of condition that she's or weight that she's lost during that lactation that will have a negative impact on rebreeding performance. So if you can't back fat scan them or back fat measure them, you can look at uh, weighing them in a weigh scale or with a with a weigh band. Uh, when should signs of teats filling with milk be seen before birth? So the other line obviously starts to develop some uh, some little while before farrowing, but 
If you're looking for the presence of milk as an indicator for when the sow is likely to farrow down, then in normal instances, I'd suggest that if there's milk present on the teat line, that sow is almost certainly going to farrow within the next 12 to 24 hours, probably nearer 12. But I would hasten to say we will all have been caught out by sows we thought were going to farrow and didn't farrow for a few days and also vice versa where we've looked at sows and thought they weren't going to farrow and they did. Um, I could quickly answer this one for Clancy. You ask is the boar shown mating or teasing for AI? At that particular slide it was a natural service. Yes. Um, what are the horseshoe rings for? So the horseshoe rings are there to put pressure on the flanks of the sow and that tends to um, uh, be a substitute for the boar front legs being on the sow and just the stimulation of that horseshoe plastic aid helps to um, encourage the sow to feel that she's being mated and encourages her to draw the semen in during AI. Um, they're used by a number of producers. Some producers would use um, bungee ropes and they would clip a bungee rope together just in front of the hind legs of the sow and that pressure, that stimulation there seems to act in a similar way. But you don't need aids like that. Like I said, you can stand by the sow yourself. You can sit on the sow. You can rub the flank of the sow. Essentially, without being too crude, you want to be the, the boar. You want to be doing the nuzzling and essentially doing the lovemaking to the sow such that the semen that you're putting in through a catheter can go and inseminate it and get her pregnant. I used to use them and I think in the picture it showed two members of staff and they were serving three sows and it enables you to do that doesn't it? It speeds the job up a little bit. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, what is PPSR, a disease mentioned earlier? Uh, I'm assuming that was PERS was it? I think, yeah, I think that would have been PRRS. So that stands for porcine respiratory reproductive syndrome. Um, it's also known as blue ear pig disease, and it's a viral infection that can um, impact negatively on a breeding unit with increased returns, abortions, poorer quality litters, more scourer more scour in farrowing, uh, respiratory problems in the uh, rearing and finishing pigs, um, just lowers immunity and allows other diseases to come in as well. Uh, thankfully there are some good vaccines that we can use against it which generally appear to work very very well um, and in a uh, herd population system are very important. In a situation where maybe you've got one or two cells in a in a backyard situation, probably of less concern because the actual challenge of disease will be much lower. Uh, what about the use of milk and sow catheters? Sorry, I, I lost you there for a moment. You broke up, Pat. Say again. Sorry. Uh, what are your thoughts about the use of guilt? and cell catheters, obviously using a smaller one for gilts. Yeah, um, I tend to, I tend to uh, be a fa in favour of smaller catheters for gilts. Um, certainly I've seen instances where converting to using gilt catheters, not actually only in gilts but also in wean gilts, so parity one cells that are coming round for uh, having their second litter, the use of a smaller gilt catheter in that instance has certainly been beneficial in helping to have an easier service, a better lock and uh, improved insemination on the back of it.
with improved performance. Right, we're getting through them now. Uh, you have mentioned the importance of stockmanship. How long does it take to train a new staff to be competent with the work? Um, the answer that uh, I can give, which, which is in fair is applicable, is that obviously when, when you're working with stock like we do every day, there's something that you tend to learn every day. So your training period is never fully finished. But if you were to take a completely green recruit and train them through, I would suggest that they'd be um, relatively uh, competent to actually inseminate sows within a number of hours but to really do the subtleties of good identification of a sow on heat, to um, know exactly what they're doing and why they're doing it and when they're doing it, that takes months and years to learn in all honesty. Um, what are your views on mixing AI and natural mating? Um, yeah, I, I'm quite quite happy if, if that's undertaken. Um, as a general rule, most people don't. The reason being that if you're going to the effort of using AI, the quality of the bores that you're going to be using through that semen semen flat pack is likely to be much better than the bore that you will be using to top that service up. Um, so you're likely to dilute the quality of the litter that's been born by using natural service. But natural service can be excellent as a means of helping to identify the correct time to serve an animal. So if you serve with a bore firstly, that obviously gives you a good indication that the sow or gilt is properly on heat and willing to be served and doing a second service with AI the following day is often a good means of helping to improve accuracy of timing and a um, good way of getting extra genetic merit into the sow as well. How do you measure back fat in a small holding environment? Um, the one thing about back fat measuring, whether it's in a larger environment or a small holder environment, is you need to have the animal pretty well restrained. So beauty of um, backyard style small holder systems is that uh, the animals are often more able to be bribed with a bucket of food in front of them in the same way that I tend to bribe my cattle to move them around. So first point is to make sure that they're well restrained and then it comes down to having the correct piece of equipment and obviously the training in being able to do the scanning to get that figure. It's not intrinsically difficult, it's not particularly expensive, but it, uh, it, you need the correct piece of kit and you need to uh, have had a little bit of training in what you're doing, but restraint is key. How old is too old for a boar? Um, when it's jiggered and unable to get up and move around after the steps. <laughs> Um, slightly facetious answer, but it, it doesn't matter. If the boar is older but fertile, completely mobile and able to move around, then I've got no problem with him being used. Um, if the boar is uh, struggling with arthritis or is ill in his own way, then obviously for his own reasons he shouldn't be utilised and should either be sent in or uh, retired. 
the criteria then comes as to whether he's too big to actually serve the sows that he's being asked to serve. So providing he's not excessively large and that the sows can physically take the weight of the boar that's being asked to serve them, then I don't have an issue with age. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, certainly at a commercial level, boars that are being uh, kept at stud and going into flat packs would be rotated fairly regularly in order to improve genetic quality on an ongoing basis to try and maximize uh, performance of the rearing herd in terms of growth and food conversion. But in a backyard situation, I don't see that it really matters as long as the welfare of the stock aren't compromised. What is your view on single parity herds in respect of the ideal parity profile mentioned and consequent productivity? So single parity herds can work extremely well in the fact that we're not bringing new stock into them and uh, as such we can have a more stable unit and arguably on the back of that potentially a healthier unit. The issue tends to be that as um, sales age particularly there has to be some natural wastage as sows get called out for performing less well or they die or they have to be cold for lameness. So there's a risk that the herd size can shrink slightly unless it is topped up early on with, a, with an extra intake. But the other issue is as the sows age, as I said earlier on, the productivity of them definitely declines um, and in an indoor situation, um, that would be manifest as just they may still have good numbers of piglets. They may still be relatively fertile, but as the sow ages, the quality of the litter tends to deteriorate. So we get more smaller quality pigs and the ability of the sows to rear them goes down. They, they themselves are less able to milk well, possibly they've got some underlying uh, subclinical mastitis issues. Um, they're physically larger frames, so they're more likely to overlay their piglets. Um, so that tends to be the issue. But if you're culling them out before these really become an issue, say parity six, then um, they can work very well indeed. I thought you were a sow when you gave birth. Weaned guilt is not something I had heard of. Is it age? No, you're quite right. Um, once a guilt technically is the term uh, used only up until the first farrowing, absolutely after that, the animal does become a sow. But so often we talk about uh, weaned gilts, meaning parity one sows, that it's just a it's just a saying I'm used to using with clients. And it's really just to help focus the attention on a critical age group of animals within the herd, such that um, we can ensure that they're well managed for a longer productive life. But you're absolutely right. Te technically, I'm wrong. Uh, guilt is only a guilt up until her first farrowing, then she's a sow. Right, the very last question. I have a gilt who farrowed on the 27th of September, 13 piglets and now losing weight even with ad lib food. What is the earliest I can wean them? 27th of September. Um, yes. On, on a commercial uh, scale herd, those piglets would be weaned now. So, um, Four weeks would be what we would look for as a minimum in our weaning age. Um, and in order to achieve that, we're looking at uh, having ex ideally given them some creep feeding prior to weaning and weaning them into um, good quality uh, accommodation. I'm probably getting the impression that this is um, uh, 
more of a rare breed situation. So if, if that's the case, most people in that instance would probably tend to wean their cells at six or even eight weeks of uh, lactation length. But if, if in this instance, the cell's losing weight, the piglets are thriving, they're picking up food and otherwise healthy, I think you can wean them now, just manage them very carefully after they've been weaned to ensure that they don't check. So good feed, good water access, and critically, a good, clean, warm, dry, draft-free environment. Uh, right, there is one more coming, and I will make this the last one. So if there's any other questions, uh, we'll deal with them offline, um, probably because it's one that should be answered. What is the ethics of using a boar with his daughter? So, <laughs> the the glib answer to that is that um, if you get a successful mating producing the type of pig that you want, that's known as line breeding and is there to select for particular traits. If it doesn't work, it's called inbreeding effectively. So, um, it is undertaken um, to try and fix traits in all species. Um, wouldn't realistically be undertaken on a commercial pig unit, but um, in maybe smaller operations, rare breeds, where there's maybe less ability to easily access a non-related boar, then it does happen. But what I would tend to suggest, if that is the case, is that we um, look at the progeny from that mating very carefully and ideally consider them as pigs destined for uh, the freezer rather than destined for breeding perhaps. Right, thank you very much Adrian. I'll just wait for Tina to put the next slide up. So uh, contact for anything to do with the series is Emily Boyce from the pork team. We're taking questions for the next two webinars in the series prior to the evening as well as on the night. Useful for us to make sure we cover any particular areas of interest in the subject. Next in the series is weaning on Wednesday the 11th of November, growing and finishing on Tuesday the 24th of November, um, and to find any information out you can visit uh, for this webinar, you can go to AHDB's events archive, AHDB small scale pig keeping and the BPA. Feedback is important. It will be sent with a link to the recording. In the feedback, the feedback is the opportunity to ask further questions to Adrian as we know things can come to mind once the session has finished. If you know of anyone else interested in the program, please feel free to share the link you'll receive in the follow up email. And just to finish off, thank you very much, Adrian, for your time this evening. And I think that was a, a, a very, very useful and interesting topic. And um, um, hopefully everyone took a lot away from it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hopefully see everyone then on Wednesday the 11th of November. Thank you very much. Cheers. Good night. Good night.